joining us this evening to talk about different factors that you can look for on your property that will help protect your freshwater health. We are going to be doing a bit of introductions about this specific project and why we're talking about this. And Chloe and I are going to be your hosts for the evening. So Chloe is our Natural Edge Program Manager. And I am Monica, the Communications and Fundraising Coordinator. So we'll be going back and forth during the presentation. And if you have questions for either of us, either about the content you hear us talking about, or if you're having any tech issues or anything like that, please feel free to send either of us a private message over Zoom and we can address those uh, technology questions right away and the Q&A we will save for at the end. And I also have our contact information up on the screen. So if you have any questions for either of us that you think about at a later date, or you're interested in some of the things that we talk about and how you might be able to utilize the resources or participate in our programs, you can contact us at the emails on the screen. So Chloe and I both work for Watersheds Canada, which is a national nonprofit organization. We're based in Perth, which is about an hour from Ottawa. And we're really focused on helping people, landowners, students, community groups, take local action so that they can protect their freshwater areas. In particular, we focus on lakes, rivers, and shorelines. So we do this through a number of different programs. The one that's up on the screen is actually a fish habitat enhancement project. We also are going to be talking about the Natural Edge Shoreline Renaturalization Program and the Love Your Lake Stewardship and Education Program. We have a number of different resources that we co-create with amazing people and community groups so that they can take local action. And this is all possible because we are able to pilot and package our programs in Eastern Ontario and then share them with others across Canada. So our programs are run in British Columbia, they've been run in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and now even New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. So we are on two coasts, working our way up to the third one of the Canadian border, but we are just really, uh, really grateful for all of the different groups that we are able to work with to help people protect their freshwater. And this specific program, so you might have noticed maybe this logo on some of our recent communications pieces, or you might have tuned in to the first part of this webinar series. And this is all part of a project called the Ontario Shoreline and Freshwater Health Multimedia Experience, which is very graciously funded by Wildlife Habitat Canada's Community Conservation Action Program. And this program is really about helping people, in particular youth and families, connect with their freshwater in a couple of different ways, learning to assess different factors, connect with their local community and with their local water body, and then have actionable steps that they can take in order to help protect the wildlife and the ecosystem that is around them. So like I said tonight is the second part of a two-part webinar series so if you missed the first one we held it about a month ago and it is called exploring how we can all protect freshwater health. This webinar is available on our YouTube page and we will be sending out a whole bunch of resources after tonight and we will include that webinar link if you missed it and you would like to go back and watch it you are welcome to do so. And we are also in the midst of creating a video lesson. So it will go through different factors on land of a shoreline property and how they might impact the aquatic environment that they are adjacent to. So we are doing this video lesson in partnership with Pine Grove Productions. So this was us just a few weeks ago back when you know it was very warm and sunny and we were able to go out on some shoreline properties across eastern Ontario and just film different things that are going on on Ontario's lakes right now. So you can look forward to that video in the new year. We also have created a self-assessment exercise which is really wonderful for families especially grandchildren and children because they can easily help fill in the different sections of this exercise. So it's really about getting to know your lake or river more and thinking about some steps that you might be able to take to help address different issues or threats that you might be seeing on your lake. And it will also tie into different native plants that might be suitable for your property. And Chloe will go into more detail about how you'll know what type of plants to plant on a property. But if you would like to access any of the resources that we talk about tonight, you can do so by visiting watersheds.ca resources. 
And the final part of this project, once people kind of go through learning about the on land and the underwater ecosystem, different actions that people are taking and how they impact those ecosystems, we are going to be able to take some action and do some fall shoreline renaturalizations. And these are some of our photos from previous field seasons where we're able to do demonstration sites so the community can come out and naturalize a shoreline on say a park. And we also will be naturalizing some private properties. So we're going to dive right into how to assess your property to help protect your freshwater health. So what's going to happen is I'm going to take the perspective of a Love Your Lake person, and I'll explain what that program is in a second. And then Chloe's going to take over and talk about our site visits from a natural edge perspective. So there are different things that we look for on a property from these two programs, and they have different kind of action steps that go along with them. So for people who aren't familiar with the Love Your Lake program, it is a shoreline evaluation and stewardship program that is co-created and coordinated by the Canadian Wildlife Federation and Watersheds Canada. And as you can see in the photo, we have two trained staff members who are out on a boat on the lake and they are assessing properties from the water. So they have a detailed protocol sheet that they're filling out and looking at different factors on the land and how they impact the water ecosystem. And then what happens is those uh, results are put into a database and each property owner receives a personalized property report with some voluntary actions or recommendations about what they can do on their property to help protect their lake health. So this is not a regulatory program. It is all about raising awareness and education about what's going on on the lake community. And the information is all private. So the property owners only receiving information about their own property. They don't know anything else about their neighbors or anyone else living on the lake. And so they are able to just look at that, see if there's anything that they would like to do on their property and then take action if it is appropriate to do so. So here is our hypothetical shoreline property. And so, when we're doing a Love Your Lake assessment, we are going to divide the property up into three parts. And we do this mostly out of ease. So we wanna make sure that we're not missing anything when we look at a property. And so what we do is we divide it up into three parts. So you'll see that section number one is the section that is closest to the person in the boat when they're assessing the property. And this is the aquatic zone. So it's usually about 10 meters from shore. Then we have number two, which is the shoreline as a linear feature. So we're just looking at what's happening right where the water and the land are meeting. And depending on the year, sorry, the time of year, this can actually be in a different spot. So if we are experiencing spring floods, or maybe in the summer there's more drought conditions, we have a couple of different ways that we can try and find where the natural shoreline would be, if you will, rather than looking very high on land where there might be flood, or if it's very, very low water conditions because there is a summer drought. And then the final section we're looking at is number three, which is the riparian zone. And it is the first 30 meters or so of the property. And really a critical area for wildlife habitat uh, and also really places and things that can help protect your lake health. So we'll be going through some of them, but this is really what we call the ribbon of life. So it supports um, a vast majority of wildlife, both terrestrial and aquatic. And there are a number of different factors that can help protect a property from things like erosion and also protect the water quality, things like eutrophication and sedimentation. So we'll start with our aquatic zone. So one of the first things that we're going to be looking at are habitat features. So things like aquatic vegetation. So this can be on the water and obvious like a lily like we have on the screen. It can be things like cattails, maybe there are submergent vegetation as well. We want to record if they are natural or native versus invasive. And if we can identify the invasive species, we will, and we'll put that into the reports. 
Sometimes lake communities are very aware of the different types of invasive species they have, and sometimes it might be new to them. So they will want to take action very quickly to help prevent the spread of that invasive species. We'll then look at the substrate or the bottom of the lake if we can see it. This is not always possible depending on the clarity of the lake or the depth, but if we can see the bottom of the lake, then we will record that because that has some implications for wildlife habitat, things like fish spawning beds and hiding places for different small macroinvertebrates or even uh, fish and turtles. We're then going to look a little bit, uh, not quite the shoreline, but in the water. So things like downed trees, aquatic logs, uh, littoral coarse wood, we're going to be looking for these really crucial habitat structures to see if they are present. They are especially valuable for things like herons and turtles who may be hunting on the logs or the turtles that may be basking on them. And then this property probably doesn't have another feature, which is overhanging vegetation. But this can be really critical for maintaining a cool water temperature along the shore, providing protection and shade from predators. But this one probably doesn't because based on where the trees are, they're a bit set back from the shoreline, so it's likely they're not overhanging. Um, they can also be really great for dropping branches and leaves into the water and helping maintain uh, that kind of woody debris in the water. So now we'll go up to the second part of a property, which is the shoreline. And there are a couple of different things that we look for here. So the first one is if there is a dock present. So we realize that many people have a cottage that kind of came with the dock and maybe it's not something that you put in yourself. And so you know that it eventually needs to be replaced, but it's not something that you want to undertake before you have to. So we're thinking of things like concrete docks or things that were put in more in the past rather than now. Even if you have a dock that's not quite failing yet, you can have it in the back of your mind that you have a plan. So some types of docks that we recommend that are quite environmentally friendly are cantilever, post, and floating docks. And these ones are really great because they don't inhibit the growth of aquatic vegetation underneath the dock. And it also provides shade and uh, doesn't block the pathway of wildlife to go underneath it. They also tend to have minimal impact on the lake bottom. And things like floating docks are just right on top of the water and don't harm the habitat around the water. This property doesn't have one, but oftentimes we see erosion control structures on a property. So things like a retaining wall or riprap. And so we'll document that and then offer some advice about what to do once that retaining wall starts failing. So if there was a retaining wall down where the arrow was, we would document that, but then we would also comment on how they have a nice native plant buffer right behind it. So this is really a great idea to start as soon as possible, even if your retaining wall isn't filling yet, to get some native plants in behind it so that they can eventually take over for the role that the erosion control structure is playing. So these deep root uh, trees and shrubs especially will help keep the soil together on thing, from things like wave action from the water or from overland runoff as it goes down the slope of the property. So we always recommend having a native plant buffer and that way it can help protect the shoreline and really armor it from any different type of erosion. And the final thing that we look at is a percentage. So when we look at the shoreline as a linear feature, we want to see how much of it is natural, how much of it is manicured or developed, how much of it is degraded. So if we see things like bank erosion, if it is regenerative, so oftentimes this can be a section of the shoreline that people are leaving natural. So maybe they have a lawn on one part of the property, but then they're letting it grow on another side of the property. This can look like a meadow often or just a no mow zone, so taller grasses. 
And then we also want to look and see if there's anything developed, like I said, a retaining wall or a dock. And then our final section is the riparian zone. So for this one, I'm going to just show some real examples of properties. So the riparian zone we said was the 30 meters up land. So for this property, we'll notice that first it's a lawn. So it's a manicured riparian zone. We notice that the building is set back about 30 meters, which is uh, best practice if possible for a property just to help slow down risks from erosion and overland runoff. Again, we realized that this was not always the case and that people aren't always able to have their property be that far back. So we just say that as far back as possible as you can be is great. And you know to have that native plant buffer in between to really help protect your shoreline from erosion. If you have buildings, either your main building or outbuildings like a boathouse really close to the water, you wanna make sure that you have things like paint cans or chemicals up high so that if you are in a place that has spring flooding, it's not you know, getting those chemicals and accidentally putting them into the water. We'll also notice along the right hand side, right on the side is a stair, like in-ground stairs and a post dock. So the in-ground stairs, uh, we really try to recommend people have above ground and open back stairs if possible. So that is for a couple of different reasons. The first being that open backed and raised helps slow the amount of erosion that happens on a property. This property isn't too sloped, but on very steep slopes, it is a great way to help prevent erosion from foot traffic, especially if you're going straight down to the water by a one pathway, it can really speed up the erosion that you're seeing. In-ground stairs also have a tendency to erode along the side, so the water isn't able to go into the stairs, and so it just kind of runs along the side of the stairs and picks up sediment with it as it goes into the water. So open back stairs are also great because they allow vegetation to grow underneath them. So the sunlight and rain can go through the backs. And this allows even more kind of stabilization of the slope to take place because the roots are able to hold the soil in place. Here is another property. So we can see the substrate of this property in the aquatic zone. It's very sandy, not a lot of aquatic vegetation going on here but we can see on the shoreline feature that there is riprap. So riprap is often put in by engineers to help slow impacts of erosion. So this property is not very far set back. We can see in the riparian zone, it's very close to the shore. And so they might be experiencing some erosion and because their property is so close, they've put in the riprap to try and protect their shoreline and not keep loosening it into the water. So in a situation like this, the Lever Lake property report might recommend something like vegetated riprap, which is where you put the plants in between the rocks and you're helping to further protect the shore from things like wave action or on land uh, runoff. And so this is only kind of prescribed, if you will, by engineers. So you would need to have a consultation to make sure this is appropriate for your property. But it might be something that the Lever Lake report recommends you look into. Also in the riparian zone of this property, we can see that the boats are actually directly on the ground. They're not up on a boat rack. So again, this can lead to runoff along the sides of the boats. People can also lose their boats, perhaps not a canoe, but if you have like an inflatable uh, toy or anything like that, you wanna make sure that it's far up onto the property and not at risk of going into the water from a strong rain event. And also we want to look at different structures. So the one on the property on the left doesn't seem to have any structures, but we can see that the one on the right side of the fence has a couple of different structures like the gazebo. And so we would note those things as well in the property report. We would also look on land to see if there's anything like a deck, because again, like the stairs, there are different types of decks that can be a bit more environmentally friendly and help protect your property from erosion. 
We can also, depending on the property, see erosion on land. So real erosion where you can see the sand or the soil actually going straight down into the water. Sometimes people have erosion on very severe slopes. So we will recommend different strategies in the Lever Lake report for that as well. So why does all of this matter? It matters for both people and for wildlife. So all of these different factors that we've just looked at play a role in protecting the health of our lakes and rivers. So on the screen, you can see a number of different native wildlife that depend on healthy shorelines, whether that's the kind of shoreline itself or the riparian zone being the 30 meters. So animals and different insects, fish, everything needs this area for things like nesting, migrating, feeding, habitat, and hiding from predators. And it is estimated that up to 90% of aquatic species and 70% of terrestrial species need a healthy shoreline in order to survive. We also care about keeping these areas clean and pristine because we enjoy being by them. So in this picture in the back, you can see different kind of toys and a dock where people are presumably jumping off into the water. We go to these places to relax, to wind down, to spend time with family and friends, to go out recreationally on the water. Maybe we're fishing or hunting. And these areas are just really important for us to enjoy as well. And so we can work to protect the quality of the lake for both us and the wildlife that live there. So a couple of different resources from the Love Your Lake program. The first are a couple of surveys that you can fill in. There's a value survey. So even if you are, sorry, your lake hasn't participated in the Love Your Lake program, you can fill in the value survey. And this is really helpful for our team, especially to know what type of things people value on their lake and what problems they're seeing on their lake. And we can help tailor either resources in the reports or we can create education and outreach materials on a specific topic if enough people are telling us that they're experiencing that problem. If you are someone who has participated in the Love Your Lake program, you can fill out an evaluation survey. So after you get your report and you read through it, you can let us know how helpful it was, if there was anything that you felt was missing. And again, we can help tailor the program to meet the needs of Canadians. And you can fill in both of those surveys at loveyourlake.ca slash survey. Another resource that can be downloaded right away at watersheds.ca slash resources is the Lake Protection Workbook. So this was created by the Lake Links Planning Committee and it's kind of a report card for your property. So you go through different sections just as I have of your property, things like lawn and garden, your septic system, light pollution, noise pollution, anything that is going on on your shoreline property and you're going to give it a number. And once you add up all of your numbers for each section, you will get a total at the end that will tell you kind of where your property sits and different actions that you can take to help improve that score. So maybe some things aren't applicable to your property, that's fine, but there are recommendations throughout of ways that you can help protect your lake and take action. There's a number of resources in that booklet as well. Another thing that you can do in about a month's time is attend Lake Links. So Lake Links is a annual workshop. It is typically in person, but of course this year it is online. And it is an opportunity for lake and river groups, scientists and property owners, students to come together and talk about the different issues they're facing on their lakes and rivers. So this year's theme is Take the Challenge, connecting what we say and actually do in order to protect our lakes and rivers. We have just announced the agenda. So we have different case studies on how lake communities are taking action and also a keynote presentation from Dr. Nathan Young of University of Ottawa. This is a free event. It's taking place on Saturday, October 23rd from 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And you can register for it at watersheds.ca slash lake hyphen links hyphen 2021. 
So now I'm going to pass it on over to Chloe, who is going to be talking about the Natural Edge program and how she conducts a site visit for that program. Thanks, Monica. Um, so the Natural Edge is a shoreline naturalization program where we work with waterfront property owners to restore their shoreline back to a natural state by planting different native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. So we work with them to create a shoreline that provides all the benefits of having a natural shoreline while still making it functional for the landowner's lifestyle. Now we at Watersheds Canada, Canada deliver in Eastern Ontario, but we actually have partners throughout Canada. So we have partners in Saskatchewan, BC, different areas of Ontario, as well as New Brunswick. So afterwards, if you have any questions um, about your property and if you're not in our delivery region, I suggest you check out our partners on our website there to see if you fall within within any of theirs. Next slide. Great. So one of the main benefits that, that a natural shoreline provides is its erosion control and soil stabilizing ability. One of the main issues I see and typically what I get called out to a site visit for um, is about landowners concern about losing their shoreline. So what we've seen, especially with the large floods that we had here in Eastern Ontario back in uh, 2017 and 2019, is that a lot of land was lost and we were seeing a lot of severe erosion occurring. And this is from high flood waters, kind of washing out the shoreline. Um, and typically that was found on properties that didn't have uh, a natural or a, a vegetated buffer in place. So as you can see in this diagram, different types of plant species have different types of root systems. So what we typically see on properties where there's a manicured lawn is that there's just very short grass in place and those short grasses have very short root systems. Whereas you get to taller plants such as wildflowers, different, uh, different shrubs and trees and you get very deep rooted, um, deep -rooted plants and plants that will grow deep into the ground, uh, both down and outwards. So these root systems are really great for holding soil in place. Roots are basically like rebar in concrete where it just holds it all together. So every time that um, a, wave, a wave comes by or there's wave action hitting the shore, those roots are there to hold that soil. Whereas if you just have those short grass, grass roots, then as the water comes in, it tends to undercut and wash out all that, all that soil. And it's, um, once it's started, it's quite easy to lose a big amount of, or a lot of land in a very short amount of time. So when I go out to a property, I'm always looking at, is there a manicured lawn? Where is the erosion starting and where do we have to focus our attention? Um, and if they do have other types of shrubs, what types of shrubs and trees are already there? What's doing well? Um, and where can we really enhance their buffer? Um, next slide. So here's just a short video of what we tend to do on a site visit. So firstly, there's a few steps that we take. Um, first, we like to determine what soil is there. Knowing the type of soil tells us which types of plants we should be planting. So I use a soil auger um, and I just take a soil sample on the shoreline and I prefer to dry it out on my hand. Um, and this just shows me what the soil is made up of. So it's easier to separate out the sand from the clays, but anyone can really do a soil sample on their own property. If you just take a handful of your soil um, and squeeze it in your fist, if it falls apart and breaks up easily and is very gritty, then you're going to have more sand present. If it's a, more of a fine powder um, and is sticky when it's wet, then you're gonna have more clay present. And if it's somewhere in between, then you're gonna have more of a loam. And you don't have to be very specific about it, but having a general idea of like uh, sand versus clay um, is very helpful when choosing plants. And then, oh, I think if you go ahead on the video, thank you. Um, so once you know your soil type, you're going to be wanting to pick out your planting compartments. 
And to start, you're really going to want to think about the long term uh, goals and plans for your shoreline. So you're going to want to think about where your water access points are, because we suggest that you keep 25% of your shoreline for yourself and give 75% back to nature. So within that 25%, that's where you're going to access the water. So your pathway down to the water, how you're going to enter to go swimming. If you have um, a dock placed out, then that's gonna be where you access your dock or even put in a, a canoe or a kayak. And of course, any seeding areas that you'll wanna keep open um, or know where to keep the plants lower as well. You can still have plants in place, but in those main view areas, you can just choose some shorter flowering shrubs and maybe some wildflowers to put in. So once you've thought about those areas, um, just walk along your shoreline and, and really pick it out and design it. I always like to talk with the landowner, just walk the shoreline and see how they use their shoreline um, in their everyday life. So knowing that, we go ahead and we start making a plan. So we've uh, developed our Natural Edge app and we use this to create our planting or our restoration plans. Um, so using this, and there'll be more photos and videos later, we actually take photos of your shoreline and then we go through and enter the site conditions. So we've already determined the soil type so we can enter that in. And then we've already talked about where your main viewpoints are. So that tells me where we want to put in shorter plants, where maybe we want to put a tree for some shade. So we take all of that information and we enter it into our app. And then that helps us choose which um, plant species we want to, we want to use. Um, and our number one kind of filter for choosing plants is of course your um, hardiness zone. So that's based on your location. Um, there's uh, hardiness zones throughout Canada. So, and there's maps online that you can go in and even on our website, you can go in by your location to find out your hardiness zone. Um, oh, other things that you'll that we always like to talk about or uh, with the landowner is whether you get spring flooding, because um, then we're going to have to choose some flood tolerant plants. Are you more of a, a dry area where when you get a drought, it's very dry and hard and um, more difficult for the plants to grow? Because then we're going to choose more drought resistant plants. And next, next slide. So here again, um, we were taking a soil sample. I was doing a workshop up on, uh, at a certain lake. And here I, you see I have the soil auger, but again, you can just use a shovel to do this. Um, but if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see how the soil comes out. Um, and you don't have to go down too deep. It gives a good idea of what soil is there. Um, but also what a soil sample tells me is how deep it goes. So what kind of plant stock can I use? Is it really rocky and shallow? In that case, I'm going to use some smaller bare root stock or plug stock. Whereas if it's deep, then I like to use some larger potted stock to put in. Um, so that's, that's also beneficial that are what a uh, soil sample will tell me. Next slide. And here's another video. So another site condition that we look at is sunlight availability. Uh, different species prefer to grow in full sun, partial sun, or in complete shade. So that's another site condition that, that we enter into our app. Um, so you can see I'm just looking up because you'll have to look at around, look up and look around at the different uh, trees that will be there, how big their crown is. Um, and it's a bit tough to do in the spring or in the fall when the leaves aren't actually there. So you kind of have to imagine, but that really helps to choose which plants we can put in. And you can see here using the app, we take a photo of the compartment and just draw out the outline. And then also at a site visit, we'll actually take measurements of each compartment. So taking those measurements just gives us a better idea of how many plants we'll actually put in place. So for a full, if you wanna create a very thick vegetative buffer, then you're gonna to wanna to do a plant per every like one to two square meters. Um, but it also depends on which types of plants you're putting in. If you're putting in a tree, then you're gonna to wanna to space those out a bit further from each other. 
Um, and if you're doing some smaller shrubs versus larger shrubs, again, larger, you'd space them further out from each other. And for smaller shrubs, you can pack them in densely. Um, but the great thing about shrubs too is that they spread through their underground root system. So over time, they're going to be spreading and naturalizing this area. Once we go in and do a planting, that area becomes a no-mo zone. So you're going, just going to let it naturalize and let those plants really start to spread out. The first year that the plants go in, most of their energy is going to be in, uh, put into their root systems. But after that, you'll see the new shoots will start uh, coming up and they'll really fill in the area nicely. Um, and again, all compartments can have some different uh, conditions. So I'll actually have you go to the next slide, Monica. Oh, so you can see here how that, uh, or that compartment was actually um, all shaded. But then in this compartment here, uh, showing on the app, it was a manicured lawn. There was lots of um, duckweed and algae actually within the water there. And so this landowner really wanted to naturalize their shoreline because they were experiencing erosion and they wanted to improve their water quality. One of the big benefits of, natural, of a natural shoreline is that it filters out excess nutrients and toxins from water runoff. So any water that's running, say, down off the road and is sloping down into the water, these plants will slow down that water and filter out these excess nutrients and toxins. Um, but here you can see that it was really densely planted because this landowner wanted to create a really uh, great vegetative buffer and wanted it to establish very quickly. And next photo. So here you can see that there are many different compartments to this planting plan. But if you look at the site conditions on the right, um, they are different in some different compartments. So compartment a is different from compartment D. Um, so in certain cases, you'll actually want to take a soil sample in the different compartments. One area might be quite wet and might be more sandy, whereas another area might be more, um, more clay or, more, or drier. So it's nice to take a few different soil samples if you can see that there's a noticeable change in the habitat there. Next photo. So here are planting plans. Um, once we've designed the, the, uh, the plan on your property with you, we actually sync it up with our website and it produces like a PDF. So these are just a few shots of what our planting plan looks like. We have our plant selection summary table. So this shows all of the plants that we've chosen and put into your plan. And it shows the different types of stock as well. So potted stock, which is larger versus bare root, um, and then wildflowers. And then it also comes with a plant description table. So this, uh, this plan had pasture rose and snowberry included in it. So it gives a nice description of what each plant is, a photo of what it looks like, as well as the average height for it so that you know say hey this is the area that i want it to be kept lower because it's my main view well we've got pasture rose or snowberry which are more of the smaller shrubs and then on the right hand side you can see one of the planting compartments and how it outlines all of the different site conditions and then shows you exactly where which plant or which species will be planted next photo So here's some examples of properties that we've planted in the past. Um, this one here, before it was planted, they actually lost a lot, of, um, a lot of land to erosion very quickly because they were at the very end of the lake and they got some very strong winds and some, um, and some very big waves or heavy wave action. So it was coming up on their property and really Kind of eating away at their shoreline and um, and breaking up that soil, dragging it back out into the water. And once you've lost your land, you can't get it back. So it was really important to them to stabilize it very, very quickly. So we chose some fast growing shrubs um, for their property. And it's hard to see from the photo, but basically in the after photo along the back left hand side, there was a very steep cliff. 
So they didn't really have a big area right down by the water. So we made sure to leave enough space for them to sit um, so that they can enjoy actually being down by the water, but still chose great um, low growing native shrubs that took over this area and really worked to stabilize the shoreline. Uh, this was like, there's sweet kale in there and there's also swamp milkweed. Um, we always like to include some wildflowers that are, um, that are great, provide great habitat for our pollinator species. Next photo. And here is um, another one. This is probably my favorite restoration project that we've done. Um, this landowner had just basically a manicured lawn going right down to the river. They experienced flooding every year and were seeing erosion occurring very quickly. And they wanted a more natural approach um, versus putting in a hardened shoreline. Also because hardened shorelines like riprap can cost, I mean, riprap can cost up to $300 per foot. So it can easily go up to like $30,000 for a hundred foot shoreline. Um, so it's very, very expensive. Whereas um, planting is a lot more cost effective and it, um, and it's a better, it creates more habitat for the wildlife as well. So this was their solution to the erosion problems that they were experiencing. And this property was planted in the fall of 2016. And this after photo was taken in the summer of 2019. So all of this happened just within three years, which is really great to see. Um, they've left it as a no mow zone. So they mow up to this new buffer and then they've just let it take over. And we did plant wildflowers at this property. Um, but not in this actual section or this compartment. So all of these wildflowers have just spread in over those three years and filled in the snow mow zone. And next photo. So we do have many resources to help you out. Um, you don't have to go th necessarily have to go through our program. We're there to help um, if you need it, but there are many things you can do just on your own. We have lots of resources up on our website. So to start, you can look at our shoreline habitat creation manual, which has more tips on how to naturalize your shoreline yourself. Um, there's also our wildflower garden guide. So that goes more into the perennial species and what you can add to your shoreline. And then we also have our native plant database online. So we've developed this, and this is what is integrated into our app. Um, so this shows all riparian species and first when you first go on to it you'll actually be looking at a map and this is our hardiness zone map so you'll go in by your location pick your hardiness zone and then you can filter by province so um, i would do ontario being in ontario and then you'd go in for say the types of plants you'd want so if you want a shrub or more wildflowers or trees if you're looking for deciduous trees to put in to create shade. And then when I spoke about how we always look for the moisture level, the soil type, the sunlight availability, once you figured all that out, you can actually um, enter it into the, to the filter system and it will filter through, those, um, through all the plants for you and show you the best um, species. Um, I think next slide, those are. All right. So that is kind of the end of what Chloe and I look for on different site visits, but we did want to save a bit of time at the end in case anyone had any questions. So you can either pop them in the chat or you can, uh, I think you can raise your hand on Zoom and you can unmute yourself and we would be happy to answer your questions. I had a question. I don't know if I had to raise my hand. This is Laura's calling or speaking. Mm -hmm. I wonder about participation in, in like a natural edge program. What does it entail? Is there a cost? Um, and how do we sign up? So um, if you go on our natural edge website, there is a contact form that you can fill out. Um, for, we get offer free site visits to start. So if you're in our delivery area, you can sign up for a free site visit and we'll come out, meet with you on your property and walk your shoreline for you or with you. Um, kind of talk to you about your goals and what you'd like to do and any issues that you would that you're noticing. 
Um, and then after talking, if you would benefit from planting, then we can go ahead and design a planting plan. Right now for uh, most of East, for, or for Eastern Ontario, we do have funding for our natural edge kits. And so our kits are $250 and it comes with your custom planting plan and then 50 plants. Um, so there's 35 smaller bare root, 10 potted and five wildflowers. And that kind of comes with the kit. You can always purchase more at cost as well, depending on how big your property is. And we actually order all the plants and put these kits together. And then you would come to our office, pick up your kit and plant your shoreline. So it's a, uh, you can start with just a site visit and we can come out and see what your property is like. Um, we have our brochure up online as well. That shows you exactly what's in a kit. So you can find that under resources. Excellent. Mm -hmm. We have a question in the chat from Pat. Um, so she's, or they're wondering how to prep the soil first if you want to plant seeds. So it depends on which seeds. Um, usually on seed packs, you'll have like a description of how to um, kind of sow them in, what time of year and how deep they should be planted. Um, but usually you'd have to turn up the soil and then again, it depends on the seed for how deep to plant them and to like cover them up. Um, I know when I've done it with seeds, I've done it at the like, very end of November because they have to go through like the uh, freeze and thaw cycle for them to actually sprout up. Um, but it's more just turning the, the soil to make it loose um, before planting. It depends on how big of an area though too. If you are on a shoreline, I don't typically do seeding like that because then that's just a lot of exposed soil. Um, so like with the snow melt or rain, then a lot of that soil will be, will be washed in because there's nothing on top of it. Um, so it just depends on the size of the area and where you'll be doing it. Perfect. Um, someone was asking how to get a lakeshore assessment done, which I'm thinking is the Love Your Lake assessment. So we don't do those for individual properties. We do it by entire lakes. So if you are part of your lake community and you think that other people would be interested in receiving the program, you can go to the Love Your Lake website and actually request that your lake or river community be assessed in future years. And that way, you know, either the local community group or if you're in Eastern Ontario, perhaps it's us that's coming out to assess all the properties and then everyone is getting those property reports mailed to them. And all of the things, by the way, that Chloe and I are saying tonight, all the resources and things like that, we will be linking them out to an email to you probably going out on Friday. So if you forgot to write anything down or you want to pass on information to someone else, we will be preparing all of that for you in an email. Um, we have another question from Laura asking if full rushes are invasive and how you can control them. Um, I think it depends on what type you're looking at, um, but I know just for controlling any type of invasive species, ways that I've seen some landowners do it is to like cut them very short and then cover the area in like a, a tarp or black plastic and just kind of let it cook under the sun for a bit to kill those off and then coming in afterwards and planting native species right away some fast growing native species that can take over the area quickly um, yeah <laughs> and I would add that we have a webinar with the invading species center next week so it might be of interest, uh, Laura, if you're not already registered for that, to submit that question to them because they have best management practices and different handouts and things for a wide variety of invasive species. And so they might have a more detailed approach or if something's working somewhere, then they'll share that with everyone else. And I see you are registered, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, they're the experts, so I would yeah. ask that to them. <laughs> Is pressure treated wood bad for lakes used in docks? 
yes, it's not great um, because those have come like it's treated with chemicals and that will leach into the water. So um, yeah, it's it's not the best. Um, like I've seen even old railroad railroad ties, which are really terrible to put in as as an erosion control measure. Um, but anything that's treated like that will um, leak some chemicals in. Bonnie's asking about the shoreline habitat creation manual. It is available in hard copy. Uh, actually, all three of the ones that Chloe talked about are available in hard copy. They are $4 each. And you can shoot me an email. I can put that in the chat and we can figure out pick up. I feel like we've done pick up with you before, Bonnie. Um, and we can uh, save the shipping costs at least. If you would like to order some, you can also order the wildflower garden guides and the native plant care guides. And we are putting out a new guide in the near future, which will uh, also be available for free download as PDF, but then also as a hard copy. If anyone has any more questions, now is the time. I will also actually put Chloe's uh, email in the chat too, in case you have any more plant questions for her, then she can follow up with you. Uh, we are just about to start fall planting season, so we just ask that you be patient with us uh, with the email reply time, but we will get back to you. Um, we're just, uh, yeah, it's fall. So we're about to start fall planting season, which is kind of crazy, but, uh, it's that time of year we're, again. We're out in the field pretty much until mid-November now. So uh, yeah, I apologize. We're a bit slow on the email when we, once we get to this point. <laughs> but it doesn't look like anyone else has any other questions. I don't think I missed anything in the chat. But again, if you think of anything, oh, what are we planting in the fall? So people who have already signed up for the Natural Edge program, they can sign up for a planting in the spring or the fall. So we will be going out across eastern and central-ish Ontario and planting those properties. Um, so that's what's going on this fall. Lots of plants in the ground, which will be really wonderful for all of those lake communities. Yeah, if you keep an eye on our Facebook page, we will be posting whenever we do any public plantings, which we might have a few of this fall. Um, so those are plantings done on, say, parks, or if we're doing like a demo site on someone's property, um, we invite the public to come out to help us plant it and learn more about our projects and, um, and more about shoreline restoration, really get a hands-on take with it. Oh, that is our contact information. If you want to connect with us online, you can visit our website, kind of learn more about some of the different things that we talked about today. You can send us an email or connect with us on social media. Like Chloe said, we try our very best to give people notice on different events that they can attend either in person or online. And we also have a number of videos on our YouTube page, everything from fish habitat enhancement tutorials to program testimonials to awesome underwater footage of different habitat being enhanced. Um, it's all there. So we showed you a very small uh, kind of sample of that with some of those natural edge clips. So the full versions of those are on our YouTube page. And I think that's it for the questions. So I'd just like to thank you all again for tuning in this evening with us. And you can look forward to that email at the end of the week with all the different resources we talked about today and also the recording of this webinar if you want to share it with anyone else.